One, two, three. One, two. Go ahead and turn all the mics on because it's not going to matter. It's over the air. i got to test this right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. Yeah. Just all right. Yeah. That is the typical flu. <laughs> 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 hey, Tony. How are you? One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Good to be seen. Good to be seen. I always see you virtually. Yeah, good. Oh, wow. Good start. It's very non-controversial. Oh, my God. Yeah, it was very strange. I swear I'm going to know better. I did. You know? That's why you have a deputy. That is the boss. I don't know. I I would not know what to say. No. It should be because it's being. I wish that I would get done with it. I was like, A, you want me, B, they didn't want me. Is it a B? I think it's a good one. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. That's a coming call. So do you think it's better to want to just have that or try to put the set Let's think of all the other fun things to do. Okay. I'm not moving. He's the watch. He's the watch. I'm going to be making a couple of companies. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 <laughs> so it goes back a few years. And then I went yes, to the school side. Nice. But it's all, yeah, it got a, I think, final approval. Oh, okay. Don't put me on. Seven or eight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Hi, Christina. Christina, yeah. I think I feel like I'm going to go. Maybe just see you. Yeah, I'm with Chicken Talk. And you're with Scarborough? Scarborough, I'm ready for that. Okay, great. Longevity of East. Now you're a mess. Great. Do you have an assistant, Jim? Yeah, Brian. Good stuff. Worst writing. No. Absolutely not. He's a spy man. And so. No one on my team also wants the job. I think it's going to be six months that you hopefully have somebody hired who doesn't have to be the intro. So it's not just a sub. When you sub 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 yeah, he, he lives. lives. He came to. Get one of the packs. Maybe it's in our. Hey, Have you met Anna? This is What? First two busy really like, yeah, okay, yeah, 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 yeah,
Well, welcome. Um, <laughs> Christina knows how to get me to a meeting. Uh, ask me to host it, and I'll be there. So, uh, <laughs> no, Old tricks. We're certainly pleased to host this meeting. As I understand, we're going to do uh, the first uh, hour to talk really about uh, issues and, and particular traffic projects in our southern subregion, um, which constitutes Scarborough, Biddeford, Saco, and Old Orchard. Uh, and then uh, GP Cog has some things planned for us for the second hour. Uh, so with that, I think I'll turn it over to Chris. Great. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, uh, Town of Scarborough, for hosting. Thank you all for making time out of your busy schedules. As Tom mentioned, first hour of transportation, then we'll get into um, um, discussion on community priorities and member services at GBCOG. Um, I'm Chris Chop. I'm the transportation director at uh, GBCOG. And you could maybe start with a quick round of intros. Thank then, you. I forgot that. Please. Then get in. No, you're okay. Aubrey, do you want to go? And sure. Then I'm Aubrey Miller. I'm a transportation program manager with GP Cog. Are we going this way? Yeah, let's go. Okay. Hey, everybody. Andrew Zaro. I am the community partnerships director at GP Cog. Thanks for having us. And I'm Christine Egan at GP Cog. I'm the executive director. Tom Milligan, City of Bitterford, Southern South Region Rep. Autumn Spear, the planning director for the town of Scarborough. Angela Blanchett, the town engineer in Scarborough. Brett Frank, uh, deputy director of public works for the town of Scarborough. Tom Hall, Scarborough town manager. Claire Winter, urban planner with Maine DOT. Tom, what can we do to tell them what your real title was? Oh, Tom's new title is that Tom, city, city engineer emeritus. Right. <laughs> <laughs> emeritus, it's yeah. very yeah. fancy. Because oh, no, no. between all eyes, that means <laughs> <laughs> that means wicked smart, well respected. Check out at city manager. Diana Asanza, town manager, Old Orchard Beach. Travis Moore, Interim Public Works Director, Saco. Tony Plant, bookending for the Greater Portland <laughs> Council of Governments. I'm the Director of Municipal Collaboration. Great. Thanks, everyone. It's great to have all four communities here, Maine DOT here as well. Uh, and, you know, a lot of times transportation, it can get really technical. Um, some of us are pretty frequently at the at the PACS table. That's the Portland Area Comprehensive Transportation System. It's the federally designated metropolitan planning organization for, for our region, but a lot of us are not. So we can give a little bit of background on PACS. Um, it is staffed by GPCOG. So we're GPCOG employees um, that staff the MPO, which has its federal responsibilities for coordinating planning, transportation investment decisions in the in the Portland area among 17 member communities and now six transit agencies it used to be seven but now with the merger with South Portland and Metro we're we're down to six um, being part of the MPO also provides an opportunity I would say for diversified funding options I think being part of an MPO you have more funding avenues for projects than you would otherwise if, you, if you're not part of um, that entity in that in an urban area we took a bit of a hiatus from these sub-regional meetings during the pandemic and uh, resumed them last year. I think it was uh, a motion made by uh, Jim Bennett on, on PAC's policy board, like we should get back together and, and do this. And it's an opportunity for us to, at the regional level, to kind of connect the dots between some of the local priorities um, and some of the regional planning efforts that we have underway um, in, in trying to find ways to implement your priorities, and it's a good opportunity for you all to learn what's going on from the regional perspective, but also from your neighboring communities, because you might learn that you have a lot more in common than you have um, apart, and there may be opportunities for bundling projects or um, collaborating on plans and studies together. We're seeing that with um, reimagining Route 1, which I'll put in a quick plug for. This is a multimodal transportation, land use housing, um, electrification, broadband study that will go from Biddeford to Freeport. And part of the genesis behind this study, it's, it's funded through PAX's planning program, but part of the genesis was these sub-regional meetings, particularly in the southern and the northern sub-regions last year where communities came together and said, you know, we've got a lot of our opportunities, challenges and opportunities, are on Route 1. 
Um, can we do something about it? Can we get together um, and envision a, a planning effort that lines up prioritized transportation projects? And so that's the intent there. Um, I will mention while I'm on the topic of Route 1, it's later in the agenda and we may or may not get to it, um, but we've got a kind of a visioning board. We're really early on. We're just finalizing the consultant contract as we speak. But this is an opportunity for you all um, and any others that, that join to chime in. And I think we've got index cards that are going on. Oh, okay. Just wow. Just You're stealthy. Um, <laughs> And I think the card says, you know, in five to ten years, Route 1 will be dot, 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 fill in the blank. Is this aspirational or predictive? <laughs> <laughs> I'd say aspirational. Yeah, yeah. And um, so that's a, an effort that's kicking off. And I'd say we have a lot of information in your, in your packet. And I realize we may not even have enough printouts for everyone. We've got electronic versions. There's a ton in there. And some of it's just intended to be takeaways, leave behinds. Um, because it, it is pretty detail oriented, but Aubrey and I are here to come provide the high level stuff and then get into um, more of a discussion. Aubrey, do you have a couple things? Yeah, and I see the packets going around, so if you want a paper copy, it looks like we have a few more. Nice. Um, and just to introduce a, a little bit of background on two of the, Chris mentioned as an MPO, there are federal requirements that we have. Two that we have to fulfill are um, one related to planning and one related to investing. Um, on the planning side, one is that we have to develop a long-range transportation plan, um, and long-range in this case means 20-plus years, and that plan has to include what they call a fiscally constrained list. So what we do is we estimate our funding over the next 20-plus years, and then we issue a call for projects and see how many projects we can fund with that estimated funding. Um, and then. The plan itself is not directly tied to funding, but it is the first step to getting funding later um, because funding decisions that we make later should align with a long-range plan. Um, this is a plan we update every four to five years. Um, on the investment side, a document we have to develop is the TIP, the Transportation Improvement Program. That's an actual spending plan. It covers four years. Um, it has to include all federally funded projects in our region, both federal highway and federal transit. Um, it includes both the projects that PACS has historically chosen, as well as all the projects that Maine um, DOT has chosen in our region, and that we update annually. Um, and then specifically at PACS, I just wanted to get into our long-range transportation plan. The current one is Connect 2045, and that was the first time we included a fiscally constrained list in our long-range plan. Um, and so to kind of ease into that, um, we agreed to do an interim update of the plan. And that's where Connect 2050 comes in. So we have a, we're updating the plan and issuing a new call for projects. Um, we issued the call for projects uh, earlier this month, and then they're due. Applications are due December 12th, um, and we hope to adopt the plan by the end of the summer. Um, and if you look in your packet, probably the most useful piece for today. A lot of it's for takeaway, but the most useful piece for today starts on about page 20, and those are. Pages directly pulled from Connect 2045 with your subregions projects circled. So that can be a bit of a starting point for our discussion today. Great. Thanks, Aubrey. Can I uh, yeah. notice that we have Sako in the house now? And I was yeah, wondering Sako. if we could uh, have cool. Emily and John uh, introduce themselves. And then we have another John also. Hi, here. I'm John Bohanko. I'm the city administrator for Sako. Thanks, John. I'm Emily Cole Prescott. I'm the director of planning. John. And I'm John Grande. I'm the Sustainability Program Coordinator at GP Talk. Great. Thank you all for joining us. So we've got all four communities. We've got Claire from Maine DOT and several GPCOG team members. And right now we're talking about the first part of the meetings focused on transportation. Second half is focused on community prior priorities um, and member services. Great. Um, and we realize that, like, again, some of you are not um, deeply immersed in the world of, of PACs. Um, got Tom Milligan here who's on multiple committees and boards, so you can go to Tom with questions. But I mean, our, our doors are always open. You can always pick up the phone, call us, shoot us an email. We pride ourselves in being really responsive. And there's no, no stupid question when it comes to transportation. And you know, it's, it's complicated stuff. So, But um, today, we're not expecting you all to be experts in that, but more it's an opportunity just to have a conversation about what's perkling up and bubbling up in your community as transportation priorities, whether that's 
projects that are ready for capital funding or whether it's uh, other plans and studies that you want to um, mention and, and maybe we can all connect the dots on some synergies between communities in the process. Anything else from our team way of introductions? Okay. Um, you can certainly use the, the list in the document as a starting point, but the intent for Connect 2045 is, and Connect 2050, the, the new Long Ridge plan is to provide a, a fresh opportunity for communities to submit projects and, and um, ultimately get them through like the regional process and hopefully open doors for funding down the road. Any community feel like kicking off? I know we've got a couple communities doing transportation master yeah. plans. Do you want me to start? Yeah, that'd be awesome. Um, I guess I can with that Scarborough is obviously missing from the 2045 because when we talked about it in the um, policy committee at the time for PACS, um, we were just kicking off our transportation study and knowing I can come up with projects, but it'd be more informative to have this two-year process we're going through that really kicked the tires and vetted every, uh, it's a town-wide transportation study. So out of that, um, the draft will probably be going to council next month. Mm -hmm. um, and so out of that, we've kind of prioritized some um, major corridors in Scarborough and some intersection work. So um, I guess to kick it off, um, we're seeing a lot of changes happening on our Payne Road corridor. Is, um, is definitely of high priority, as well as Gorham Road, which is our, um, it's an arterials. Um, those are the, the big ones. I, I think um, Scarborough has been beating the drum on East Grand Ave reconstruction for a very, very long time, and we've had troubles getting through PACS because it's, um, it's not Route 1, <laughs> and it's not trying to make that case of regional significance um, has been a challenge, so we struggled where to go with that one next. So I guess I know I've I kind of poked a little bit at GPCOG around that, trying to see if there's any paths or avenues, the other ways that we can kind of try to figure that out. Um, and I'm trying to think of, I don't know if Tom has any other. Is this grand a collector road? It's a, um, it, I think it is, but I don't know what the, prior, the, the yeah. priority, yeah, the yeah. number for DOT, because I don't know if Claire knows. Right? Oh, <laughs> <my head. laughs> it's probably not even on your radar, that's why. <laughs> Dale might know. <laughs> we also, in our um, transportation study, have a whole section on reimagining of our Haggis Parkway. That is a limited access highway that now is getting residential use along it. Um, and so there's a lot of white walkers and bikers and... I think we're starting to envision something more like um, Williams Clark Drive for that. Um, still moving a ton of vehicles, but is there ways to connect kind of people and bikes um, through that corridor as well? So that's um, a lot of focus has been put into that uh, by Scarborough. And then um, obviously we've been part of that reimagining Route 1 and that we have a lot of gaps in our system. Um, through Scarborough, so trying to connect sidewalks and bike routes and transit and all of the above. Um, we have a lot of missing pieces, um, little pieces of it, but really trying to connect those. So feeling like that's probably um, a lift we can, we can get to, um, especially in this kind of plan. Can I ask a question? Yeah, of course. <laughs> so, um, so on the, the Payne Road and Gorham Road, can you briefly explain what the need is for both of those? So uh, we're looking at complete streets for both of those. <laughs> Hi, John. Complete streets. Yes. Um, Payne Road is seeing um, a huge uptick in our, our volumes and safety concerns with some pinch points. Um, and as well as, like I said, just the movement of bike and pet as well on that corridor. It, it's really changing. It was like this rural corridor that you get from exit 42 to the mall. It's not that anymore. It's definitely changed what it feels like or what it looks like and um, trying to adapt to that. Yeah, we have some uses that are coming in that are more pedestrian driven and we think we have a few hotels coming in. 
three. <laughs> uh, so we think that that's going to start, you know, oh, let me walk to the Aroma Joe's that's coming in as well. Let me walk here. And so we can see a trail mm -hmm. already in parts of it. The desire path. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure that we, the plan that we have in our townwide uh, transportation study, it has a, mixed, a shared use path and a sidewalk with both sides. Would like to take a look at the pain road now you know it goes like this yeah. so we're <laughs> contemplating fixing that as well in that part and then connecting that back to the downs and then the highest parkway residential mm -hmm. and then the gorham road piece <laughs> <laughs> and um our counselor john anderson is also the our liaison for our transportation committee so he can i'm sure can chime in <laughs> as we go through this too um but for the Gorham Road piece is we've started picking away through PACs. We've been able to get funding um, for phase one and phase two. And that has been a huge difference in um, trying to connect our schools back to our residential areas. And really the goal in the master, we have a master plan laid out, um, really connects Oak Hill to that commercial district out towards Payne Road. Um, and so we have some obstacles around eight corners and the Nunsuch River and things like that and uh, what that might look like because that's also one of our village centers. Um, but connecting the community because right now it's, it's this community and that it, we, it, Scarborough is very much separated by some of these corridors and it's, it goes back to kind of that complete streets is trying to make that connection throughout. I would just add the, the one design challenge and cost challenge for both the Payne Road Corridor and Gorm Road that's just been described are crossings at the Nutsuch River. Um, uh, there are both, uh, at both locations there are constrictions and, and there will need to be essentially the new bridges constructed um, at both locations. So that's a, that's a big challenge for the design and, and cost perspective for sure. Do you know how old those bridges are off the top of your head? We can could find out. They're culverts. They're culverts today. <laughs> a better term is bridges, yeah. I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We did just implement a new impact fee for the bridge on Main Road, though, so we can have some estimates. Mm. Oh, it's a lot. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Somewhere around 2060, we'll have enough money to do it, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Angela, is there anything around the flooding of Route 1 through the marsh? Yeah, so I just talked to DOT in prep for this meeting to see um, how we, or how or if we incorporate it kind of into our PACs and GP uh, processes. And what I'm getting, and I don't know if Claire, you're part of those conversations with the, the Route 1, Route 9 um, resiliency projects is really going through with their kind of federal process and getting the monies that way, that it wouldn't be necessarily connected for looking for a local match or local support through the region for Route 1. I will say, I think they're both such huge projects that I also got the little inkling that Route 9 might be the second priority of the two, which totally makes sense, that Route One's gonna be their priority, that I could see maybe putting something in for the Route 9 piece. Um, and so I guess that's where I kind of left it with Ernie Martin um, last week was was thinking about um, maybe putting something in at least to talk about Route 9, but would probably be silent to Route 1 just because DOT has prioritized that with internally. Does that make sense? I haven't talked to Ernie yeah. about these specifically, <laughs> yeah. but I can I can follow up with yeah. him. Yeah. yeah. We can mention that our guidance communities with respect to Connect 2050 and getting projects on the list is if your project are, is already in the queue, mm -hmm. has funding for preliminary design and or construction, it's already on the list. It doesn't, you don't need to resubmit that project. Would you want us to submit something just so you, it's, because it is, like it's actually being designed now. Right. And, modeling um, and all of that, so. I think any background information you yeah. have, but you don't need okay. to formally submit it through the like process and oh, you know, okay. answer all the questions. Right. I think that's But we'll want fair. to include it as a regionally significant exactly. yes. project yes. in the yeah. long range plan. Okay, that's perfect, yeah. yeah. So it'll be a light, much lighter left on your part. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Tom. I think Angela points out very well, I'm sure most of the other communities have similar dilemmas. I know we do in Biddeford is, as the growth accelerates, it's really accelerating. 
how you deal with all the additional traffic, both pedestrian, transit, and, and motor vehicles. And often developers don't want to pay to extend the sidewalk, even though they get pushed hard. We had a recent project that we pushed and pushed. We finally ended up with a compromise that would extend the sidewalk a little ways, and we'd provide the sidewalk crossing Route 111, which is no major or no minor dealing. Uh, but from a grand level, it's just there's not enough money. I don't see the revenues coming in as a gas tax shrinks, probably less money. And our needs are becoming greater and greater. And you can't really whack, I'll use the word whack people, all sorts of impact fees to, to um, come into a community. And it's certainly, I, my opinion, our responsibility to maintain what we have. I think a lot of dollars should go to that, but that takes away from our other need, needs for expansion, addressing those issues. As Angela had pointed out, as I said, I'm sure everyone else is basic. That's just a high level, two cents worth. So, if, just jumping on the, the grid piece, I, um, I think the big challenges for that community move forward is it is not like a whole lot of other places. And I feel like I can say that since. Over my 43 years, I've worked all over the state in a bunch of different formats in a different places. Um, our Route 1 is constrained, unlike other parts of Route 1. We don't have four lanes. We barely have two lanes, and in order to be able to do anything, you would literally have to buy all the property from one side of the street. Um, we were very fortunate to get a $7.8 million earmark to do the first section of Route 1 and try to do it, uh, try to make it more pedestrian, bicycle safe, and that was the main goal. And what we've ended up at is it can't happen. So we are not going to be able to move pedestrians and bicycles from on Route 1 from Saco up to and past five points. And five points intersection is probably one of the most constrained, difficult intersections in probably in this region and in the area. So in order to fix that problem, we have to do something different than what the rules allow us to do. We're going to have to build a different quarter. We're going to have to build a different bicycle quarter. We're going to have to deal with a different pedestrian. We're going to have to think about it differently. And that's going to be really, really challenged because the rules don't contemplate that. Um, both Benefit and Saco have literally two ways to be able to get from one community to the other community. And those are just already overwhelmed. There's no simple solution. If you want to avoid either going over one of the two bridges, you have to go to the turnpike. And that's a constraint that other communities don't really have. I mean, I think about Lewis and Auburn, they got four, four bridges. Uh, you know, you think about, um, you know, you get up into, you know, the Rumpton, Mexico, Dixfield area, they have more than two bridges. You go to Bangor Brewer, they have more than two bridges. I don't care where you want to go. Any Twin Cities you have, they have more than two bridges. And I don't think any of those communities have the same sort of traffic limit. We have tried to create, and I think we've done a good job, of creating uh, a vision for a downtown where you legitimately do not need a vehicle to live in our community, given what we're trying to do. We still have work to do on that. Um, we've laid out a complete bicycle pedestrian connection from our downtown all the way back to the Eastern Trail. We have money. Some of it, we already have money. I mean, we've waited now five years to get a permit to build a river walk from DEP um, to connect the river. And we have $3 million to attend the bank wait to be able to do this for five years. I finally just told staff uh, four months ago, whatever, proceed with getting the final designs done. We're going out to bid, and I don't care what DEP says, and we'll open the bids and then go, DEP, we've waited five years, we got the money, we've got the project, what are you gonna do? Because we're just gonna jam the issue and we'll see what happens. 
Um, but that's all laid out. Most of that's already designed and ready to go, and most of it has to be built by the developers. So quite a little vision that's been created and, and set up there. Um, I just, I don't really understand, and I haven't been able to put the pieces together based on the way that the current funding rules work to figure out how Biddeford's going to be able to address their issues. Because if you can't build them, you're not going to, you're not going to buy, you know, uh, easily. I bet you would take 25 or $30 million to do all the right-of-way acquisitions in order to make Route 1 in Biddeford a complete street. It's not going to happen. And there's no system that says, okay, how are we going to build it somewhere else? I mean, we're pretty, pretty clear it's going to be on Alfred Street. That's where it needs to go. It needs to be designed. We tried to um, go through the safer streets. Uh, we didn't qualify and we'll never qualify because we don't have enough people that die under the federal highway standards. Right? It's just not going to happen. And that's pretty much what we were told. You don't have enough accidents, you don't have enough deaths, you don't have enough issues. So that money's off the table. I, I, so I, I honestly think that one of the biggest challenges you're going to have as you're thinking about it is how do you take known legitimate problems and figure out how you modify your funding mechanisms or recognize that it, it's a little different and quite frankly, at the pace that um, the AI is going and all the other things, in five years, that which we know, which is normal transportation, is probably going to be a whole lot different than the way we think about it now. So. Jim, Jim, quick, go ahead. No, yeah, I was going to say, Jim, do you think Bedford's getting to the, the tipping point where increased transit frequency could help solve some of that problem where maybe service isn't frequent enough today and not enough people are using it because of that maybe it's not reliable enough i i think it can chris but um yeah you, you, those still have to have huge quarter changes right because if it's going to be on wheels you're still putting it in the same quarter that's a mess already right and you know i kid it around I, you know um, we have these little interceptors on our public safety vehicles so that, you know, when they're coming, it turns all the lights. Is it time that we do that on public transportation? My follow-up was, given that, you know, you're saying that there's nothing that can be done on Route 1, I'm just wondering, does Biddeford have other priorities that it's preparing for the Connect 50, Connect 2050 um, submissions? I, I, but I, generally, I don't think so, Christina, okay. just because... You know, if we try to come in and make an argument that we really need to be able to build a pedestrian bike solution that is in order to solve the issue on Route 1, but we got to run it through uh, downtown and run it up through um, Alfred Street and up 111, that's not going to score, given the rules. And we also have the, the Saco Island Multimodal Bridge. You know, right. th that was in Connect 2045, so that's a very big regional investment as that moves right. forward. Mm -hmm. And Chris, is, is that... Um, that's funded for, it's funded. for preliminary yeah. design. The reality is that more. we don't think that's going to ever get funded through PACS, given the way it's on the backwater, and we're really trying to get it teed up so we get a CDS. I mean, we, Senator King included his list most of the way through, and then it didn't make it. So the two communities are now jointly working together to get it further along. We're going to be coming to you, uh, PACS, to ask us for some additional money because we're in need of them want to get it ready. Um, but the strategy is to try to get it funded through CDS and get it out of the PACS um, backlog because of just how, how expensive it's going to be and how difficult it's going to be to get that. That will help some of the movement between the downtown area, but it still doesn't deal with uh, the constraints that we have in terms of both our main streets and our Route 1. And, and just as a side note, if we slow the traffic down on Route 1 or make that quarter less efficient, we increase the in the amount of traffic that will go through our downtowns, which is the complete opposite of what we want. Successful downtowns 
re really require that you try to eliminate as much traffic that's going that has no intention of stopping and get it out of your downtown. Two traffic in a downtown hurts downtown because downtowns need pedestrian and walkability and um, experiences for people to be there and traffic is not does not help that. And so when you look at those two constraints, it's it's really a different kind of scenario than when I've worked on, you know, I I was very much part of the envisioning of what Bill Clark Drive was going to look like when I was in Westbrook. A very different sort of can issue to that community than what we have in Better Third Aid in Saco. So why don't we move to Saco and then Old Orchard next? Does sure. That sound all right? um, oh. Just wanted to follow up on that uh, the Saco Island Memorial uh, Multimodal Bridge. Uh, we're working to. Uh, uh, bring it through engineering. Uh, unfortunately, as uh, as Jim has said, the funding is uh, not going to be enough even for the engineering part of it. Uh, we're very optimistic, though. We're going to try to break it up into little pieces and try to keep it moving. Uh, and we'll, we hope to work with everybody to try to get additional funding for at least the engineering piece. And again, as you're well aware, these things take time and uh, a lot of uh, effort. So we're, we're continuing working on it and working our way through it. Uh, we, but the reality is there's not enough money there for just even the engineering at this point. But we'll, we'll break it up so that we can try to keep it moving. Great. What else from Sako's perspective? I'll turn it over to uh, either Emily or Travis. Okay. So from our perspective, we are working on a transportation master plan. Planning and public works are working pretty closely on a lot of different projects. But just to highlight the, the major pieces relevant to this conversation. Um, that plan will break up the community, Saco, into uh, different corridors, look at prioritized improvements. We've already done a pretty big community outreach in partnership with the police department for na through National Night Out. So we've already got some pretty good responses on that. So that's moving along. Out of that, we will get, like I said, a prioritized list of where we want, really want to invest our dollars in Saco. We're also going to be looking at uh, analyzing how we do impact fees in Saco and determining whether or not there's any... Uh, there's what funding mechanisms could be covered by impact fees and, and contributions to, to improvements going forward. Um, as far as other projects, uh, obviously we have some other things that we're looking at for Connect uh, 2050, but uh, one of the big things we're working on as well is our downtown gateway master plan. Um, we have uh, just uh, been put on the list for funding for that for um, uh, PACS policy board list uh, just recently and uh, that is going to make our downtown area coming in from Biddeford into Saco where you can really gain some speed um, especially if you have a lead foot maybe like me um, <laughs> it'll help me slow down as I drive through that corridor also makes some pretty good uh, bicycle and pedestrian improvements in that area and we are looking basically at all of our a lot of different areas in Saco, but those are probably the biggest highlights. Anything to add there, Travis? I say I think the other one that's on here is just the 195 um, Ocean Park Road project that we just finished the study, the traffic study on the Old Orchard and Main DOT. Go for it, Diana. So, actually, that for Old Orchard Beach, that probably is uh, one of our biggest priorities is that I-195 corridor. We've been working on it, I think, for years and years. Um, we're finally at a point where I think we have a plan that has checked off all the boxes. The study is coming to a conclusion. November 19th, it'll be going to the public and to council as a presentation. I see it's listed here for 2041, but it's this is a project that's going to have to move much quicker than that. Um, we're working with Maine DOT. So, as soon as this, um, that project is presented, we do receive our final draft. We'll be looking for funding. We're, again, partnering with Main DOT on that. So I'm hoping that this is going to be a project that we finally move forward with. Um, and it will be from the I-195 quarter all the way into the halfway intersection. And it'll extend a little bit further into some side roads uh, up to Dewey Ave. Um, but this is one area that has been a problem area for Old Orchard Beach. I think
think it's been studied. This is probably the third or fourth study that they've done, um, but we are nearing the end on that one. Um, the other projects I think that we've been looking at are more of sidewalk and um, bike-friendly paths or uh, around Ross Road, Portland Ave, and also on First Street. Um, these are three very high-traveled areas. Many people walk on this, these roads, and there is just nowhere for them to walk. So that's what the, um, the next priority is on those. And of course, all the other paving projects that we have going on in town. But those are sidewalk and bike paths for um, those busy roads and First Street. You see Ross, Portland, and First as standalone projects or projects that could be bundled no, together? probably in coordination because... There is a trail system that we want to connect to, and we want to make that all one project. Nice. Yeah. Okay. And that I-195 and Ocean Park Road transition, that's really important for SACO, too. Mm -hmm. It's for both communities, really. Right. I think that's a really essential one. I would, we would suggest one of you submit that for Connect 2050, just because it hasn't gotten into the queue for preliminary design and or construction funding. Sure. So having it on the regional list opens, opens more doors. And, yeah. And just so it's clear, the list that you have in front of you, unless the project is already has committed funding, it won't carry forward through Connect 2050 unless it's resubmitted. So it doesn't mean it'll stay in 2041 yeah. or okay. wherever it is. Yeah. If you need like the text that you submitted last time around, we can provide that. You just reach out. Um, but I know things have changed since right. <laughs> you submitted a, a couple of years ago. Yeah. Since the last one. Yeah. Great. So that's from all communities. Yeah, Tom, do you have any? Add a little bit from Jim's presentation is we will likely, well, I have to review what we put in for 2045 as far as going out Alfred Road, so we run all the way up to the Arundel line. Not, we didn't, well, we're going to have that seasonal growth area, uh, especially on the north side. Probably going to do something very cursory, high level for South Street. Now, even though that's outside the PAX boundary, I envision it happening real quickly. There's 197 units that are now under construction just on the other side of the bridge. If we wait five years, I don't know what that does to the queue. If you're going to tell me it's a waste of time, I certainly won't put it in, but uh, because it's outside the boundary. But which boundary? The PAX boundary. The, the capital. Oh. But it's still. It's still in the PAX region. It's still in Bitterford. It's, it's in Bitterford. It's in yeah. Bitterford. It's still yeah. eligible. Yeah. 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 Our, our old capital, we used to have a capital area, which is this kind of like odd shape um, that specified the urban area where we were eligible to spend capital dollars. That's gone away with the MOU, Memorandum of Understanding with Maine DOT, which was adopted by the Policy Board. I forgot to mention that at the beginning uh, last week. Um, so we no longer have a capital area for that purpose. Um, all 17 cities and towns, the entirety of your boundaries are eligible for so planning that, and investment. Yeah, so given that, we should really put in the implementation of the study that was done um, with the turnpike in order to be able to have that other side of the exit 42 and the connector in that goes around to 111 and also connects back to South Street. Um, the, even though it has never been publicly said informally, I, my understanding is that project was ready to go and then the Gorham connector got um, pushed up as the priority and that got put on the back step, back burner. <laughs> Uh, depending on what's going on with a quarter, the Gorm quarter, that may end up emerging as a higher priority again for the turnpike. So, Tom, we need to make sure you put that in. Notice I said that we need to make sure that you put that in. <laughs> Even though it's DOT sponsored. Yeah, but it's, just get it in anyways yeah. as a, a piece as it connects in. Yeah. And we, we've extended the same invitation to Main DOT to submit projects as well. And we're not talking about, like, Main DOT is not going to be submitting, like, bridge replacement projects in this plan. Like, those, we'll, we'll capture those in a different way. But other, like, transformative projects that may fall between the cracks and maybe it's a 
you know, a couple of municipalities aren't sure if they should submit. Maybe Maine DOT is sponsoring and really leading it as like a statewide priority event. That well, the, the, the nice part about that particular study has indicated that by doing that, it takes a lot of traffic off the 111 quarter on the um, May Street, South Street, because we have a lot of movement that is just moving to the westerly part of the state, coming off 111 and then going up into Hollis and all of these other locations. Any anything else on on your end um, with respect to project priorities? I know Councillor Anderson, you came in probably toward the tail end of Scarborough. <laughs> we uh, heard about a couple different ones in, in the conversation. So you covered. I heard Payne Road and Route One. Were there other areas that you covered? Gorham Road, Payne, Gorham, and Highgate, and East Grand. And Highgate, and okay. East Grand. Yep. I, I think the interesting piece that was talked about at our last transportation committee was how we factor in seasonality into where our traffic is. So we talked a lot about um, the beaches and how in the summertime in Scarborough, especially getting to the beaches takes forever going down yeah. Pine Point Road or trying to get to Higgins Beach. And again, that's an opportunity to explore probably some transit options, not necessarily traffic flow. But again, I would what I would really like to see us do in Scarborough is find out where those options are, where we could pilot or try something different to try and not necessarily make more cars flow, but know where we have those peaks, peak impacts, and be able to see what type of public transit options we could test. And I don't know if there's like grants or anything out there that we could do something, but that's always what I hear from residents is it's usually noticeable in the summertime when you're driving down Route 1 or wherever where people are trying to get to beaches. And then I think just during core, like the core times of the year, it's really just peak traffic times of people commuting back and forth. And so Route 1, Pain Road, the ones you mentioned are really the pain points. And then I would say with um, this council, at least not necessarily supporting the current proposal that MTA put forward for the Gorm connector, still making sure that we work through what are some other alternatives in parallel while they're figuring out what their next options are, which I think should go hand in hand. But again, knowing and exploring what we need to do in that corridor to really help ease traffic flow, especially during those core commuting hours, is, is a priority for many residents in North Scarborough, at least. Um, yeah, that brings up the point. Like, So we don't have necessarily a solution that we would be kind of putting, to be able to put in the application for. But these updates happen at a frequency of five years five years okay <laughs> that's good to know the, the other piece that I'm curious how it fits into this is you know with I think it was mentioned about housing growth and how I'm sure Bedford and Scarborough are probably some of the biggest contributors to the housing challenges in the state so as we think about in the future how we're trying to achieve those goals what are the future pinch points that we can get ahead of and make sure that we're thinking about those as part of this because 2045, 2050 is far away, but not that far away, but we're anticipating a pretty healthy clip of growth in this region. And so I think a lot of the stuff I heard today are issues that we have today that we need to solve, but how are we looking out 20 years to say, what are those issues gonna look like based on the zoning we have in place and where we anticipate the housing to be to make sure we're not meeting here in 2050 talking about we need to solve those problems in 2080. So just <laughs> how does how does the housing objective that we're all working on factor into the project so that we can actually get ahead of those and anticipate them as opposed to wait till we have a problem. And it sounds like there's a funding that might not be something that the funding will get if we don't have a significant problem today, but I'd like to see some planning around what we anticipate and, and make sure that we address those before they become an issue. You and sound like a planner. <laughs> <laughs> Is that good? <laughs> <laughs> he hangs on our committee. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just repeating what I hear from my <laughs> And we do have a travel, regional travel demand model. I'd say that it may not get at everything you're looking for. Um, I think it's it, not something we have budget for right now to, to do a wholesale update. 
<coughs> for, but it's something Christina and I have talked about possibly updating in the next couple of years and, and making it a little bit more sensitive to local development um, and possibly incorporating different scenarios. So we're planning for different potential outcomes rather than just one singular thing that the model says will happen. And the other thing is we're trying to also, through reimagining Route 1, so all of you are along the Route 1 corridor, really think about how you shape the future of development instead of just respond to what it is. So, you know, of course, it's going to be both together and as we go in the future. Yeah. But the reimagining Route 1 has a really robust component of it, which is kind of land use and transit-oriented development um, planning <coughs> for the big priority centers along there. And that can help us also understand how do we get ahead of the biped mm -hmm. um, issues that you're now seeing on some of your roads that were just designed for cars, but now you've got people walking and biking on them and get a little ahead on that too, John. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things that was shared yesterday in our SEDCO annual report out was that 43% of Scarborough residents now commute within and work within Scarborough. So, oh, wow. you know, people aren't any longer going <clears throat> to Portland as much as they used to. They're all here. And I think based on our zoning, I think that's kind of something we're continuing to try and inspire is keep people within Scarborough. And so that's going to change traffic patterns based on our development. So like, what does that mean in terms of our roads, but also we're still going to have the pass through from Saco and Biddeford and everywhere. So we need to like really think about all of that and what that means for Route 1 and some of these major corridors that people are traveling through. It's also an opportunity to move some people who are taking those shorter trips to non-single occupancy yes. vehicles if you have them all, you know, so many people inter-traveling in Scarborough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the interest numbers with Biddeford, and I haven't looked at them in a couple of years, that we had about um, half of the population that was working that would leave the community in order to go work somewhere, which is around 5,000, 5,500 numbers based on the last census track. And, and I can be off by a couple hundred, but we had an equal amount of people that were coming into the community. So, in the, you know, you essentially have 10,000 trips that are going on. I, another interesting piece is um, I'm estimating based on some stuff that I've done, and this is nowhere scientific, that um, since 2018 and 19, we've had about 5,000 people move out of the community and we've had about 6,000 move in. So you have this net change of 11,000 in a community of 23,000 and how much that has changed what they expect, what their culture is, what, what's going on and what the, what the priorities are. It's a community that's really wrestled with a whole bunch of different issues because of just how dramatically it has changed in the last four to five years. And so as you think about how many people are staying in mm -hmm. with the job creation that's happening in Scarborough, how many people are coming into the community, which also contributes to the traffic. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at the, you have a section two with the aspirational projects and maybe connecting back to reimagining Route 1. One of the things that keeps coming up in every transportation study we do is looking at our connector, the, the Scarborough connector, as you come off the highway at 70 onto basically our main street. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so looking at kind of the beginning, say, of our region, our Route 1 reimagining, um, we looked at different scenarios, kind of looking at maybe, as an example, how South Portland's, it ends up being you're stopping, you're making a deliberate turn, or is that a roundabout, or is that something else, What like what that looks like? And I know the last thing time it came up, it was us. Town of Scarborough need to sit down with DOT planning and start that process. So, I mean, that is aspirational and out there, but I guess if we don't start kind of talking in that planner kind of piece that we're never going to get there, but um, it, it is a big issue in the speeds that come off that highway. And so that's kind of the beginning of the southern subregion, really, for the for Route 1. And yeah. I don't know if that, not, that would be a huge transition. Yeah, not just the speeds, but then how people have to get off and then the, turn left. The go, weaving. Yeah, yes. My wife almost got in an accident because somebody didn't realize. They thought it was a four-way stop when they got off right there. And they just assumed it was. So thinking cars were going to stop and then they get in front. And so it's just that design right there is bad. Yes. Yeah. Is yeah, that the main med campus? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's a lot of weaving. It's a short. You come off the highway and you have a short distance for a light, but there's so it's a lot of jockeying yeah. yes, for positions today. through mm -hmm. there. And 
it also has still the remnants of the old, um, you know, a DOT 1950s design with a ramp going off right into one of our small, dense re residential neighborhoods. Yeah. Like, so if you don't want to do the weaving, you can also very quickly go into a little neighborhood. It's, it's yeah. not a good design all the way around. Yeah. So yeah. it's really kind of like really starting from scratch there and kind of looking at what does that need to look yeah. like. <laughs> That's a big one. It is a Maybe big one. So I put that on the like a main med or main health. I did. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, and that's a great place yeah. for it. And yeah. if, if you have like even early concept, not, yeah. not necessarily even like design concepts, but like um, we have some early schematics, vision, for, yes, we do. <laughs> yeah, where where you yeah. want to go yeah. broadly, like yeah. we could capture it in the plan. Yeah. Could be in the aspirational, and you know doors could open. We work with main duty as well to yeah. try to find a solution, planning solution first, but yeah. Any other questions about Connect 2050 for us or other Everybody things? Everybody got their deadlines on their calendars to make sure you get mm -hmm. your projects in? December 12, yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you all for being so prepared and organized. I mean, this is our third sub-regional meeting. I could say you all are the most <laughs> prepared to talk about like specific projects. Don't tell the other sub-regions. <laughs> yeah. You kicked us off well, Angela. Like you're like, let's spin the I've been waiting <laughs> since five years. <laughs> <laughs> when, when we... <laughs> all, right. Yeah. all right. All right. We're going to transition to the next card. part. Are you oh, the yeah. We'd love to have that up there. Yeah. Any point you can walk up and yeah. put it on the board or yeah. after the meeting, whatever you want to do. And grab food as you're walking around and stuff like that, which would be great. All right, so we're going to transition to the next part of the program, which is to talk about, we can continue to talk about transportation as you'd like, but there's other pieces too, too, I know, the priorities you're working on. Um, this is a, just a tad tricky for GPCOG because three of you are members of the Southern Maine Planning and Development Commission. Um, and one of you is a full GPCOG member. But actually, some of our services, even though they're more GPCOG services, are also available to our non-members, Saco Bitterford and, um, and Old Orchard. But I'm going to try to, as we go through this, we'll make sure that we differentiate those that are like considered part of your dues, Scarborough, and those that we can offer through other grant sources to all of you. All right, so I just wanted to give that as a, this is our trickiest meeting since three of you are not full members. But we work all the time with SMPDC. We're very close partners with them. And so we can also like collaborate together if there's services that you guys need that one, one of us can't provide fully. We're going to use this as a, a quick moment to grab a snack because my laptop decided to stop working. <laughs> Okay, but well, we can start with, the, we, the first one is community priorities, right? So I can get people started on that. The round robin, yeah. Yeah, all right, so the first thing is a round robin. And um, thank you, Claire. I know. Claire sat through the full round robin of the other ones. So. I will see you tomorrow. Yeah, I appreciate you being here. Um, all right, so for the round robin, what we'd love to do is go quickly through all of you, and even if you're part of the same community, it's fine to build off one another or add. Uh, we're just going to ask you to be mindful of the air time so it, each community gets their time. And um, we'd like to hear what's top of mind for you in your community. What are the burning issues that you're hearing from your residents or from your um, council or um, from your staff? What are the major things that you're thinking about? Up to three per community, three things. We, and just to set the table, it, um, our other round robins and some of our Metro Region Coalition meetings have really surfaced property tax burden this year just because of the revaluation that's been happening um, in our area and that that seems to be kind of top of mind. So that's one thing that's come up. There are other things as well. Okay, Hi, Emmy. So could I kick off with Scarborough since Angela like led the way so well last time? But we'll start, yeah, we'll start with, with John though, if that's all right. And then we'll come to the Scarborough team and then we'll go to Saco, then we'll go to Old Orchard, then we'll go to Biddeford. So I have my draft 2025 council goal, so oh, awesome. get you guys anxious. Okay. Thank you, John. But I'll, I'll try and keep it brief. Th these um, are from the council, right? You're well, yeah, these are what I'm thinking going into next year based on what we've been hearing and what we've been working on. So Wait, let me get this paper up. Yeah, I know we're paper. Paper. Write it down. <laughs> I mean, I, I think you hit the nail on the head of like the, the most common concern we're hearing is around affordability. Um, you know, 
I think there's a concern with gentrification, especially for our longtime older residents no longer being able to afford to live here. So I don't know what the solution is, but I know there's many solutions that we need to explore to help keep existing residents in their homes, especially those on fixed income. Um, one area that we're very much focused on is conservation and climate change. And so being next to the marsh, we're, we're constantly trying to figure out what are ways that we can make sure we can preserve the marsh through some of the open space work that we're doing, but also um, we, we're completing a vulnerability assessment to really understand, again, with our proximity to the coast and all the waterways around us where we have some significant risk with flooding um, based on changes in climate. Um, we also have a huge need to address some of the major capital, capital requests in our town because of the growth that we've been, been experiencing. So our primary schools are in need of a new facility. You know, our residents, because our demographics are changing, another interesting fact from yesterday was 23% of our residents have lived here three years or less. So the demographics are shifting wow. and the desire for things like community centers and things like that are becoming greater. And then again, our library is pretty small given the size of our community and the services that they provide. So we have some pretty hefty capital needs that are just getting more and more expensive the longer we wait to address them that we need to figure out. Transportation, like we've talked about, that's always a common thing. We hear from residents is just concerns about the pace of growth and how that impacts the, their perceived quality of life as it relates to traffic. I know Autumn and I, like I'm originally from Northern Virginia. So when I hear that, I'm like, this, it, it's, it's definitely getting worse, but it's still, in my opinion, not as bad as I think from people who've experienced it in different communities where, you know, you're spending hours to go a couple miles. Um, so I think those are probably what I see as like the really big challenges from what I'm hearing. I don't know, Tom or Angela or Autumn, if there's anything else that I missed. I think you hit many of mine. Uh, I was jotting down, but I would say when we go back to resiliency, it's, um, I guess I would look at resiliency of our infrastructure, because that can be sewer, storm drain, our, you know, private, it, it's everything, mm -hmm. our roads. So I kind of throw that all in one big bucket when we're doing our vulnerability assessment. We're really, that's my hyper focus, I would say, is making sure our infrastructure is in, being designed and constructed in resilience, kind of in mind. So we'll pick, now that we're up and running again, sorry, my computer decided now is the perfect time to update. So we will hop down. We're going to skip my, my GPCOG alum. Say something, Tom? Just to Just maybe to tag on one thing John sure. said, um, and this is not an issue unique to Scarborough. Uh, any of us that have, anyone who's lived here appreciate that our utter reliance, sole reliance of property tax to fund everything local. Uh, in communities like Scarborough, everything's local. There's minimal, I think 6% of our school costs are covered by state aid. So we're, we're paying the bill and we're reliant almost exclusively on property tax. And as our demographics change, um, I can't quote the numbers off my, top of my head, but we now have a higher percentage of folks 65 and up um, than those 18 and below. So that's flipped and that trend is only going to continue. And again, that's not exclusive or unique to us, but I think as a state, and Jim will know this, he's fought the battle for 43 years. He's been doing this uh, um, kind of work. Is It's going to require constitutional change and giving us the ability to find other ways to fund uh, local needs and priorities. And we're on a collision course for a tax revolt, I, I predict. Um, it's getting just untenable. People are not able to, to make it work anymore. Thank you. This is, uh, I'm sensing a theme that we're hearing from the sub-regionals. Okay, we'll go over here. We'll do soccer over here and then- Oh, we want to go by community. Yeah, we'll okay. Can I just add one thing sure. to you? We have a lot of conversations. It's a totally different thing, but I think it's kind of unique to Scarborough. We have a lot of conversations about what our identity is and what we're becoming. Scarborough is several little villages, and then we have this whole huge village west of the turnpike that's completely different. So that's a conversation we're always mm -hmm. having that I see, it, it comes up in the open space, it comes up mm -hmm. in transportation, it comes up in, in everything that we touch. So we're trying to figure that out. 
Okay, so next we are going to go to Sako. Over here, over there. Okay. I'd say for, from my standpoint with public works and transportation, uh, funding constraints is probably one of the big ones. You know, competing with other communities for, you know, projects that are all, you know, needed in, in the region, as well as infrastructure adapt adaptation, like stream smarts, you know, you got a 48 inch culvert that you get a permit and now it's a, you know, a six foot culvert or, or larger. So, you know, the cost uh, to keep the infrastructure out and then the other one is just uh, pedestrian bike accommodations, you know, the way the city has been laid out, the constraints on, you know, property that we have to do something with and it's getting creative to, you know, maybe do a little street diet to get some bike lanes in and things like that. So it's always, and then it's where do you start them, where do you stop them, you know, that type of stuff too, where you've got one area that, yeah, you can do you know, sidewalk, bike lanes, but there's no receiving, you know, road into that. You know, so that's that's kind of a challenge as well. Um, I would say there's a lot of fear in Saco. Are we planning correctly for our future? We have a lot of different um, plans going on right now. So setting ourselves up for what we want to be to Autumn's identity <laughs> consideration. We have so much uh, great things going in Saco. Um, that we really could be a lot of different things. And so how we're going to plan for that next step, I think, is one of the number one things I hear. We can be on constraints, transportation, housing, climate change. And we have been quoted as a living example of climate change. You don't need to write that on the board. But um, so dealing with that, and we, we're working very hard to do have some good investment to make sure we can. Can you talk a little bit more? Do you have an example of that? Um, our water resource recovery department, our wastewater treatment facility, uh, is actually experiencing backups from sea level rise. So that um, it's not causing permit violations right now, but it has backed up in the parking lot, uh, can't hand accommodate the flow. So we are under a major investment project to, to uh, fully upgrade and equip a new facility that is resilient to, to sea level rise impacts and can handle uh, flow for community growth. Additionally, we're working on um, the Jetty project with the, with the federal government um, with the Camp Ellis considerations there, which we're all very, very well aware of. So that's just two, but there's many. Yeah. We just finished our adaptation and action plan. So a lot of good steps in there. Thank you for sharing those. John, do you want to add anything? No, they, they did it all. I, I think the big thing we're hearing, though, is uh, our infrastructure and how we're going to prepare for that uh, climate resiliency. And um, just an example, like, uh, like Emily said, is our wastewater treatment plant. And uh, we don't expect the spur jetty to solve all the problems, uh, but maybe some of them, but we still are going to have those issues. And probably uh, we're going to have that area. We seem to have a lot of public works efforts in an area of uh, a smaller area of the city where you have a large geographic area that we need to pay more attention to. So I think we're going to have to look at balancing that. And um, it's really very difficult because uh, they're probably the most vocal uh, during the, uh, the events. And uh, but we have to look at the rest of the community and how we you know, spend our money. Thank you. All right, so we'll move on to OLB. Sure. Um, I think housing is definitely a priority in Old Orchard Beach, affordable housing as well. Um, we tend to battle this each uh, year. One of the biggest things that we've been discussing is our seasonal housing for our reserve officers um, and our J-1 students. So we've been doing some research on that as well as looking at other options for uh, affordable housing. The other um, priority that we are working on is, um, yes, climate change and our beach and dune restoration. We were just in a meeting right now on that. And <clears throat> in addition is Ocean Park and the drainage infrastructure or lack of drainage infrastructure that's there. Um, that is one area that was hit very hard 
and we are looking at that and seeing what options we have for drainage. I mean, the old Ocean Park is almost a, it's a bowl. There's no drainage anywhere around there. And we saw the biggest devastation and property damage there uh, with the January 2024 storms. Mm. Um, the other priority is our wastewater treatment facility is very similar. We just started our upgrade project. Um, it's a $38 million project that um, it was built in the 1960s. So it was time for that to be just starting this three um, upgrade construction project. The um, other thing we'll be up against is our capital equipment outlay for our fire department. We've got a couple of pieces of equipment that we need to plan for. Um, these pieces of equipment take three years to build. Um, they're in excess of a million dollars. So that is a very tough, tough um, capital item to, to try to foresee and plan for. We have to plan way ahead for that. And our human capital are actually um, retention for uh, staff and our labor force. So we've had um, constantly to move the mark on where we're at. We had a wage study done and see it's now two years and it's way outdated at this point. You have to keep updating this every single year. And we seem to not be able to get ahead of that, that curve. So that's, a, that's another priority for Thank you for sharing that. And last but not least, we have Biddeford. So let's going to start this way. So, um, I say ditto on a lot of stuff, but let me um, give you some perspective on what I think you ought to be paying attention to. So, uh, part of the, the reason that, the, from my perspective, that the tax burden issue is going to become a big deal is because the state is not paying attention to the trends. So let me give you an example. <clears throat> Revenue sharing two was created in order to be able to help service center communities. And the work that was done by Evan Ricker in the, in the past, service center communities had a tax burden somewhere between 35 to 40 percent, 45 percent higher than all the other communities. And so what they did is they took um, a half a percent of the five percent revenue sharing and put it into a dedicated account. And what they ended up doing with that is they take what's called the full value tax rate for a commitment divided by the actual state valuation, and you get your full value tax rate. And then they subtract the number that they had. That number, then anybody that has a tax rate less than that, they don't get revenue sharing too, and then they rerun the formula. So what happened is if you take a look up until about 2019, that number was 10 mils. It represented about 42% below what the state average was. Today, the full value tax rate that you use to divide that by is $11.30, and the state average is $11.25%. And what happens is communities like Biddeford, who's now at 11 20 something, we went from having revenue sharing to completely dropping off. We lost $635,000. And that $635,000 goes to the other communities out there. It no longer is helping service center communities because what's happening is the valuation growth that's happening because of all the people buying properties is going up much faster here than it is in other places. When I was in Denver, I mean, when I was in Presque Isle from 2010 to 2015, the medium, the medium single-family home was $82,000. It's not going to go up at the same pace. So I'm going to guess if I went and looked at uh, Presque Isle's, what they got for revenue sharing two, it went up. You know, Presque Isle is a service in the community, but the other ones that had really high rates were places like. Um, Patton and other places like that. So there's a shift of that policy, unintended, going away from places like the Greater Portland area and Bedford and Saco to smaller communities, which is going to drive up the service center community tax burden. At the same time, you also have the fact that our constitution requires us to tax 
property based on what they're sold, even though a lot of the homes that are being sold are being sold for the income stream for um, Airbnbs. So just that issue is one issue that's going to drive this stuff, and somebody has got to get the state to begin to pay attention to this because it's going to make places like this really, really hard to raise money. At the same time, you have all this demand that will help economic development. So it's one. So with revenue sharing, I heard revaluation, and the third. I don't know if you got. I saw you got revenue sharing. I think you could probably expand that, Jim. Your degree that's general purpose aid education. It's revenue it's, sharing. It's all, all of that. Of those it's all of it. It's, uh, it's basically don't. It's the state policies that are not keeping up with what's going on. It's not. You know. It's these are. These are ways that you can see this is going on, right? And so that's why I use an example of state policies. Number two, there is an absolute trend to end up having the people that are interested in what's going on in local communities, their priorities are different than the people that have been doing this for a long time. So um, I've noticed with that some means of the it's time to retire, Jim. You're talking about yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so one of the issues today, there are more and more people that expect the issues of things like climate change, social justice, affordable housing, all of those issues are as important, if not more important, than plowing snow, providing a library, and taking care of your capital assets. That traditionally has not been what local government has been in Maine. And you have this giant conflict that's beginning to emerge in terms of what is local government about and what are we going to do about that? And that's going to put additional pressure on that piece. And what's remarkable is what Jim's describing has happened in the last, within the last 10 years. I'd say in the last four to five in Bedford. Yeah. And so that work. is changing what local government is. And again, it puts more pressures on how are we going to do what we need to do at the same time that we're absolutely dying with increasing capital needs and costs and everything else. The last piece is just how do you be creative in order to be able to um, hang on, attract, recruit employees. I mean, we're literally working on a project right now um, that we are, uh, probably will announce in the next month or two where we're working with a developer that we are going to include um, a potential for our entry level employees, include school teachers to be able to move into some rents where part of, if they stay for a certain period of time, some of what they've paid will end up going towards a down payment for a house because teacher salaries, why would you work in Bedford when the, the rents are 2,500, 3,000 when you can get essentially the same salary and work in, um, at Bonnie Eagle and work in other communities where you don't have them? You, you have to play a whole different game than that before. And of course, that drives all those other issues as well. And it's a whole different dynamic as an employer than it has been before. So, thank you. Appreciate it. Anyone else from Bedford? Yes, Jim summed up most of what I was going to say anyway. It's all in the sense. We just locally, we have so many competing needs. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we're a CSO community. That takes mega bucks, takes away from other assets. We still have to maintain our assets because I think I've said before, why would an employer want to come in to a community and hit potholes all the time when they can go two communities up or even the next next door with a smooth road? And it just shows that there is more, I'll call it pride in keeping their infrastructure up. That's certainly not the case always, but certainly if it's not funded, can't do it. I can't think of the amount of dollars we put in locally um, into uh, main the DOT roads just because we're not on the collective paving list. We don't get the money. Uh, Public Works is very tired of plowing gravel in the winter, and the citizens don't like to drive on gravel and potholes. I know Jim really has a fit that we're doing work for the state, but it's one of these catch 22s. This needs to be a better source of source of funding, so it all comes down to dollars and cents. Yeah. And back to what you were saying about the role of municipal government and that's, that size and scope of what is within that lens. Um, any last words before we move on? Thoughts? I, I have a last word. With, yeah. I agree with Jim on the policy. Um, 
there was just there have been some recent things that are just not written for the entire state. They're not really taking into account how we've developed here. They're taking into account how northern Maine's developing, mm -hmm. and they put a lot more development pressures on us, even though we're already taking a bulk of some of the development. Yeah. Well, what, one final thing I'd just say, just sure. to, something to be, I think, wary of. Uh, we've seen the first wave of it, and I think it's the first of, of many, perhaps. But with the well-documented deficit for housing statewide. Christine, there would be 80,000 unit range. And Statewide for our region, 24,000. All right, this, this group plus the rest of GBCO. Well, with the LD 2003, I think, was the first time in my memory in this profession where the state uh, began to start to prescribe uh, density and, and land use issues at the local level and started to really erode home rule. I think that's only going to continue and probably get greater. And so that's, uh, I, although on one hand, uh, intellectually, I get it, and I don't disagree with it. Uh, I think it's going to create some real, real hardships at the local level. Well, thank you everyone for sharing your insights and what you're hearing every day, your boots on the ground in your respective communities. And a couple of what you, uh, items and issues that you shared, we've already heard in a couple of the other sub-regionals, um, and some new ones as well. So uh, we're going to go backwards to go forward because, like I said, my laptop needed a little refresh before we started. Um, so a uh, little reminder, although we've, we've, uh, we've scratched this itch at this point, who we are, GP Cog. Um, so we were founded in 1969. Um, we've, we've changed a little bit since then. Uh, but we are the regional um, organization that uh, planning and um, transportation organization. Our strategic plan uh, was updated and adopted by the executive committee this last spring. And our four pillars are to support our member communities uh, for strong local government, great places, shared prosperity, and a sustainable future. Um, most of what you just talked about, um, none of what you just shared lived in a silo. Everything um, is connected to everything else, much like our region. So whether you are a neighboring municipality just outside of the Greater Portland Council of Governments or um, you, know, you are many towns apart from each other, there are common themes that bring us together. And the role that we play at GPCOG is to bring you together um, uh, for that shared prosperity to help solve the big issues in our greater region together. Um, you know all of us, but if you need to see more, go to our website, gpcog.org. Um, so I actually like the way we just did this, even though it was unintentional. Uh, so we sent out a survey. Many of you may have seen it uh, at the end of the summer, early fall. And it was to discuss um, from an advocacy perspective how could we support our um, municipalities up in Augusta. And so we just wanted to do a quick breakdown for you. Um, and you're going to notice some common themes here from what you just shared uh, are the top priorities and top concerns. So from what we heard from those who responded to our survey, uh, the top priorities were, we heard going into this next year um, first was around increased state and federal funding for infrastructure. So that should sound really familiar because you just talked about it for a little bit. Um, and this, is, this was one of the most common um, priorities were heard from folks. Uh, you touched on this briefly, but in this next year, we're expecting to be hitting um, a, a fiscal cliff. So we need to get creative uh, at the municipal level. Um, and GPCOG wants to be supportive of our municipalities in the event that you want um, support in, in um, advocating for your needs in your community in Augusta. Uh, second would be property tax relief for residents. We've heard quite a few um, uh, ideas that were being floated around a couple of sub-regionals ago. We heard folks talking about how the homestead exemption has not been adopted, uh, sorry, amended in quite some time, um, but we need to stop. Um, folks have said that they need to stop relying on property taxes as the only mechanism to fund municipal services because the scope of municipal services have expanded over time. Um, I forget, uh, I, I'll, I'm going to paraphrase it, but uh, another town administrator said that the mechanism, taxes aren't the issue. It's the mechanism in which um, we use property taxes have outlived its usefulness over time, and it's time to get more creative about that. Um, and we've also... Jerry, that's a Jerry Bryan is, is a... <laughs> yeah, I wasn't going to out him like that. But yes, it was Jerry. Um, and then expanded growth and development opportunities and tools. So we've heard a lot about housing. We have a housing crisis in the greater Portland region. We have one in the state of Maine. Um, every community is dealing with it in a way that, that makes sense for them. There is no one-size-fits-all when it comes to dealing with housing and housing affordability in your community. So we, um, we want to support you in uh, ta uh, tackling your housing issues in your community in a way that makes sense. So the way it looks for Scarborough is going to look differently 
for the way it looks in Harrison. And we want to make sure we're working with those of you who are making those decisions. And then quickly, the top concerns, again, the budget shortfall that we're seeing on how that might limit funding opportunities at the municipal level. Uh, again, one size fits all for um, funding options, um, implementing state policies like LD 2003. Uh, finding that nuance where we can in our communities. Uh, and again, we um, have heard from folks that they are ready to get additional support when it comes to advocacy engagement. Uh, and that's something that I think that we're going we're gonna to work closely with you all on. So if I, if I could just, on the property tax review thing, go take a look at, you can go to the state, go pull for, for a couple of county. How much of the percentage of revenue sharing to that you've lost in the last four years? Yeah. Right, it's and that's a, and that's directly related to this policy. And you're going to see hundreds of thousands of dollars that have left this region that went somewhere else. Oh, billions, billions. I'm sure. billions. Yeah, yeah, and and just run it. That stuff's available right on the website at the main revenue and take a look at that. So you don't have to fight for getting, trying to get more money. You just got to fight for it to get back to the policies that's there. And the other half, of, the other part of that equation is look at the sales tax um, proceeds you know, from this region that we send to Augusta. That is the only way that flows back to us. Yeah, and the, the, the other piece is that you, the valuation increase that's going on is if I decided, because we're moving, right? So if I decided I wanted to Airbnb my house, it's 3,400 square feet. If I wanted to Airbnb that house, that house is worth more than what I'm going to sell it for as a house. And yet, when that, if I sold that as an Airbnb, somebody buys it as an income stream, it increases the value. That means all my neighbors' and values are going to go up. And it's not the same thing. And we just need to change the policy to show that if you are using it as an Airbnb, we can tax that differently as opposed to having a single family home. And that generates new money right away. And it stops the flow from this region to somewhere else. Can I add just one thing? So just for a little context, particularly for Old Orchard Beach, Bitterford, and Saco, is GPCOG only just began doing advocacy a few years ago. And the last bullet that Andrew had up was really about member engagement. And when we um, originally put together the advocacy program under our executive committee's guidance, the idea was that we would be working in concert with MMA, and MMA is doing a lot of work on these things, but that our region does have some particular issues, as Jim and Tom have pointed out, in terms of you know, getting our fair share, which is not an easy argument to have up in Augusta, by the way. So, um, so our work, I think, on this is going to, A, first of all, be in alignment with MMA, and, but B, also really depend on all of you to go to Augusta or submit testimony. The other issue, which is one that, that Tom brought up, is around the home rule. I think there is going to be quite a bit of legislation that's going to continue to advance good housing ideas, but may have some negative impacts locally. And so Emmy's going to talk a little bit about some of the housing work that we can offer you. Part of our agenda at GPCOG is to show off the good work that is being done on housing in a way of trying to ask legislators to give us some more time to put into place LD 2003 and also to show that we can do more work on welcoming housing without needing sticks applied to us. So um, I just wanted to respond to that, Tom, and just a little bit about our strategy on that. And we're working very closely with DECD and others in the administration to try to lift up the success stories. And Scarborough actually has been a real success story. So is Biddeford. Um, so with that, I just want to give a little context. Can I just can I expand on that? So advocacy, uh, and I'm trying to think, I think there are some examples where for all too long the MMA through its legislative policy committee has been kind of reactive. They're not, mm -hmm. we're not proposing new legislation in large part, we're reacting to something. And it's usually, you know, puts us in a deficit, right? We're already on our heels. Um, so advocacy in my mind is about advancing. Yeah. Is that what you're suggesting? Yes, and I think we are going to be a little bit on the defense this year. Mm -hmm. um, so to acknowledge that, um, the, we have a lot. We didn't talk about this, but let me just take a moment because Tom was bringing up the issue of gas tax. The real value of gas tax has been declining over time with increasing electrification. We don't have enough money to maintain what we have, let alone do the things that we need to do in transportation. 
A good example of something that I think we're going to be working on proactively over the next four to five years is around transportation funding, because that's a big issue for all of us. And so PACS just adopted a problem statement. It's very controversial. We don't have enough money. Um, and so they, they adopted that, and now the GP Cog Executive Committee has followed, and the next thing is to start um, looking at the, there's a very long laundry list of different ways that we can raise transportation revenue, but getting people to consensus around those different options and what the mix is right. is very difficult. We're not going to be able to lead this as GP Cog or even the region, but we can work to try to advance that conversation because the pandemic and the pandemic money is basically masked an underlying continued deficit on transportation money. So we're gonna to need to do that. So that's kind of a long answer of saying, yeah, there's gonna be some defense and there's also gonna be some proactive work that I think we need to do. Yeah, it's, forgive me for getting probably deeper than you wanna go, but I, I wanna, Andrew, can you just go back one slide? Sure. Um, you know, we, we talked about the, the complicated fund for, funding formulas. Those are so complicated, it's really hard to crack that door. Yeah. And there's winners and losers if you change it. And so that's why it hasn't changed in large part. But I think there are some opportunities. You know, it, it, um, one of our past counselors called growth and development, there's a growth tax. You're penalized for growing your yes. tax base. Yep. And let's yeah. face it, um, so I, I, I'm resigned to the fact that we need to kind of pay our own way going forward. So if we can be unbridled, uh, you know, expanded, um, allowances through the TIF legislation to allow us to spend it differently to yeah. help fund our local local thing, local priorities. Um, yeah. And that might be a way for us to get a little more property tax relief um, and some shelter benefit at the same time. Yeah I, yeah, I think that's a great idea. I mean, I, I know for the longest time, local sales tax options have been discussed, meals and tax, and everybody says it can't happen, but there is a breaking point eventually. And it's worked in other places. You can even have re regional sales tax initiatives to pay for infrastructure. There are things that you can do. And so, uh, you know, I, uh, with all things in the legislature, as many of you know, you have to wait for the right window to open. And so our idea, particularly on something like transportation funding or on looking for something, TIF might be easier right. than something and like a local sales tax. I think there's other ways, there to, ways to do to it. Provide relief that may not be as controversial. Yep. And we still have to be ready for when it's right for the, the bigger structural fixes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And last, now that I went back to the slide, if I didn't say it, I'm going to say it again just to be clear. We are not trying to be um, redundant of what MMA also already does in, in terms of advocacy. This is more in the context of supporting um, supporting our members on what's showing up, what we're identifying right now with these sub-regionals, finding those common themes and then showing up for you. But um, if you've ever been, MMA by design it has a big tent. If you go to the LPC, yeah. every interest statewide, top to bottom, east to west, is represented there, as it should be. Yeah. And so uh, I think we have some things in common and probably different than other areas of the state. Yeah. Certainly do. I, I, I'm just, I, I, just push back on you just a little bit. I've been on that LPC for most of 30 years. I chaired it at one point when I was the president. What is happening in terms of the formulas? If you don't get in front of it, you're not going to be able to pull it back. To go from a 30 or 40, it was 42% of what the state average was. And that fit right in with service in the community. The cutoff point now is below what the state average is. And that was never the intent. And when they, when they took it from 10 mils to 1050 to 11 to 1130, it was under a whole different set of circumstances. That policy was driven in the 19, 2015. And it's, it's take, literally taken millions of dollars away and it's gonna to continue to take it away from this region. At the same time that you're all crying for additional money. If you don't pay attention to that, in five years, you're never going to get it back. And right now, you have the opportunity to do that. MMA has not adopted that. I think I'm going to get the service center community to put a bill in. We're going to try to put a bill in um, through our state reps that says that the, that number for that um, revenue share of two has to be tied to 40% of whatever the state average was for the previous year. So there's some policy that's driven with that to keep it so it funds those things. The, the point I'm trying to make is that if you look at this issue only from I need more money and not understanding the underlying issues, you're going to miss an opportunity to be able to present 
for something that is going to be, it's going to be unbelievable what the impact's going to be in the next three to five years. I hope I'm wrong, but usually when I get my stuff into this thing, my experience has been, I'm usually not that far off over my career, and I'll be glad to try to help and provide more details and work with it within, the, within your team. So you anticipated what I was going to ask, which is, could you send me or send us like some information on on what you're talking about, and maybe we can take a look at how that might work. Yeah, I mean, uh, when we're talking about we're doing it in coordination of MMA, the way that we set up our advocacy program is that we will never go and contradict what a MMA has, and we'll try to have continual dialogue. At the same time, our region has particular needs, and we need to be organized in order to stand up for them. And I think everybody here knows, like, Arusta County, everybody's a really strong, they're all united, they're all asking for the same thing all the time. We in Southern Maine, we don't tend to coordinate quite as closely, and we, we would benefit from a little bit closer. Work. That's my point. We may yeah. need to band together and mm -hmm. be at odds with MMA on a policy position. Does that make you feel comfortable? Yeah, I'm feeling great right now. <laughs> Did you see me squirm? <laughs> I have one more, and then we have to. Yeah, one thing that I appreciate about what Nina does is she really gets into, as a lot of us have seen, the heart of the issue. And, and Jim, you bring up some good points. But when we look at infrastructure funding, let's try to keep an eye holistically, because there have been a couple of times over the last few years where some funding went to housing, it could have been matched with the Clean Water SRF, it could have mm -hmm. brought in five times more funding for the state, um, but instead it went to like a housing initiative that just brought a dollar for dollar rather than a one dollar to five dollars at a time when our SRF really needs it. So let's just try to, when we talk about prioritize, pr prioritizing needs and working as a region, let's make sure that the dollars are going to the most expanded program for the most funding for Southern Maine. Well said. One last comment is, like, Emily, I might want to, you know, um, the state is sending up this new main Office of Community Affairs, which is, the purpose is to coordinate, except for transportation, <laughs> all the other agency work together and how they work with locals. And, like, the example you just gave, I'm not aware of, and it would be really great for us to have a little bit more of the knowledge that you're seeing on the ground do you be able to bring to MOCA? They just appointed just, I think, last week, Samantha Horn, who's the new head of it. She seems extremely open. And I think the state is acknowledging that because it's so siloed in the way that it approaches these different issues, it can be missing a connection like what you just said, Emily. So we might want to draw a little bit of your expertise in. And if others of you are seeing that on the ground, if you could let us know, because we're talking all the time with the state agencies about how they can do it a little bit better. OK. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to do a little um, rapid fire new and new-ish member services. So if you look in front of you, I just handed out a packet with a lot of information, including our new shiny member services brochure. Some of it looks familiar, some of it is new. Um, so I'm just going to walk you through some of uh, what we are, um, what we do, because uh, you know we want to make sure that we're making sure our members have the most, um, get the most out of us. Uh, so a couple, and this, this came from talking to communities of what do they need, what do you need, what would be impactful. First would be annual budget priorities, hearing from a lot of folks um, that it would be really helpful to have uh, uh, facilitations around annual uh, goal setting at the beginning of a session. Some select boards and councils do it, some don't, but we all know that a budget is a, a declaration of values for your community. And especially as you start to put the crunch on where you can take those finite resources and use them, whether it's a CIP budget or an operation budget, um, we are offering uh, for communities who would like to take advantage of it um, a facilitation around that. Uh, another would be roles and responsibilities. We see this typically with smaller towns and select boards. The difference between uh, the town manager or administrator and the select board. Um, what, uh, who does what, what the charter says if there is one, um, and just having a facilitation around that relationship. Um, it can be uh, one of the most impactful, we've seen it a couple times now, it can be one of the impact, most impactful facilitations um, just because it gets everyone on the same page and makes sure that people are um, norming well together. Um, getting the most out of your meetings, uh, as a recovering elected official from the city of Portland, uh, we all know the, um, the impact of having an efficient meeting uh, that is, uh, has established rules uh, is, uh, you know, folks are playing by, um, the, uh, by those rules. And um, uh, you would think that it's something that folks opt into right away, but actually it's a really um, 
subjective experience depending on which select board or council you're going to. So that's facilitation we can give for folks with some best practices. We've heard from a few um, that uh, crash course uh, on uh, just finance 101 is really helpful, uh, especially for newly elected officials who have no experience uh, with public budgeting. Uh, it would be a really useful tool. I mean, for the most part, MMA has their, um, their onboarding process, which is a nice binder. Uh, but we would like to offer to go places and to have a little bit more of an in-depth conversation around finance for the public sector and municipal budgeting. And then what we are calling facilitation on the fly, it is sort of what it sounds like. What are your needs? This microphone is disagreeing with me. Uh, what are your needs? They can be really specific and nuanced to your community. And then the likelihood is because um, we have a, a team that has a diverse background of experience that we can show up and um, help you triage the issue or issues and help facilitate um, uh, whatever that need is with your, your elected or appointed uh, officials. Any questions? Is there a dedicated facilitation team or do you draw on staff resources depending on the need? You've got three of them here, actually all four of us. So Tony, me, Andrew, and Emily do it and depending on what the issue is. So. You can draw straws, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah we've done like, um, I just did Shabig, Islands, select board, you know, retreat. We did um, Harrison, roles and responsibilities. We did, um, what were the other ones that we did? We did Gray, having the planning board and the council, council get along. Um, <laughs> it's best when you have these before there's a problem, right? But I suspect yeah, it's usually, the yeah. The annual budget priorities and the finance crash course, those are like, straightforward. The other ones are kind of more like, you got a tricky wicket, you need somebody neutral in the room. Yeah. If anything comes to mind, my contacts on the bottom of that. But this, these are meant to be relatively light lifts um, for us to come out and, and be that facilitator for communities. Okay. It's included in your member dues. You get one a year if you want one. Correct. So the next item we're gonna talk about, um, tapping into funding. Um, one of these faces should look really familiar to some of you in the room. Paul Johnson, our Economic Development Director of Scarborough. Um, and then Belinda Ray is our Director of Strategic Partnerships. So they started um, mid-spring um, a weekly podcast uh, webinar that we put online called Money Mondays. It's 15 minutes or less. It's very uh, direct and it is uh, highlighting one or two local, state, federal grant opportunities and it is a uh, every week is something completely different. Uh, it's an opportunity for you all to be able to connect uh, directly to funding resources because you're all doing your jobs every day and sometimes it's hard to take a moment to find a new funding uh, source. Uh, I can show you an example of what, uh, hey, there it is. So this is our, the homepage and if you go to the YouTube channel, um, we have them all um, archived right here. So it can be anything from small business grants to GoPIF to Brownfield, and there are a bunch of them. Again, the average is 10-ish minutes. Uh, they're really useful. I've heard from a couple of folks who have taken advantage of them, uh, and they said, I had no idea that this was a, an option for us and we're gonna apply. Belinda is uh, kind of amazing <laughs> at identifying specifically federal funding opportunities and um, putting them there for folks to take advantage of. And so. if you go to the live one and you have a particular project you're interested in, you can like vet it through them and they'll give you advice about like if it's going to work or how heavy a lift it is. So it's an, it can be interactive. Otherwise, you can just come to check it out um, as the archive. And you can go sign up for this if you're interested in learning more. Um, we have, if you just go to the, the web page on GBCOG's site, you can sign up and every week you'll just get an email saying, hey, this is what we talked about and it gets sent right to you. But it's just a very... Uh, it's supposed to make your life a little bit easier in getting access to new funding streams. All right, I'm going to hand this off to my colleague, Emmy, who was so kind enough to go ahead and write down all of your uh, priorities a moment ago. Yeah, but Emmy, I'm sorry, I have to preempt you for just a second, sure. because um, Emmy is about to talk about the Housing Opportunity Program, which we can have Scarborough apply for, but for the other three communities, we have money through PACs to do housing. So everything she, she says, is relevant, it's just a different funding source for the three of you. That's a very important distinction, yes. Um, okay, so, well, first of all, back up. We've already talked a lot about housing as an issue for virtually everyone 
in the state and certainly in, in this um, subregion. Um, so this is sort of an outline of how we see the issue. Um, how many of you were at our housing summit this past year? A couple of you. Okay, great. We had people there. <laughs> <laughs> Your people were talking yeah. about those people. Yeah. Well, it was a great event. Um, essentially, um, this is our assessment of our region's needs. So we have um, we have developed a methodology that determines that we need um, 24,000 new housing units by 2030. Um, so that will not only meet demand, but of course, you know, enhance um, affordability, accessibility, contributes to workforce development all of those things that, that you've already mentioned. Um, of course, we are aiming to build as strategically as possible so that we can conserve, preserve land, so that we can um, you know, make sure that we're really putting it in places that promote that workforce development. Um, and we need to work together on this. Um, it's, it's one of the trickiest issues um, you know, of our time. And it is a climate issue, it is a workforce issue, it is a transportation issue. So. Um, this is this is our outline of that of that issue. You can go to the next slide. Um, for those of you who were at the summit, we unveiled um, our Great Maine Neighborhoods website uh, that features um, a housing data dashboard. So um, this the majority of of this data is is from the census and Maine, Maine housing. Um, we are launching a, a project through the um, Housing Opportunity Program to um, pilot a uh, housing data uh, collection um, and uh, uh, data, um, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the words, uh, not a dashboard. Um, oh. Database. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, it's been a long day. <laughs> database. Um, so that, you know, we have these goals and we can actually see um, how we're doing on, on those goals in real time. Um, so that's something that's coming out of that one of those projects. Um, but in the meantime, there's a lot of great data on there. We have a community profile for, for each one of you if you want to go um, and take a look. We also have a housing toolkit um, that provides a lot of tools that I'm sure you're already familiar with, maybe some that you're not. Um, but it provides sort of a, a quick um, take on each of those tools, um, provides some examples, which I sourced from your communities in some instances. So thank you for doing already really great work. Um, and so feel free to dive into um, any of those resources um, as needed and to reach out if you have questions about any of them. Next slide. <coughs> So here are a few of our um, technical assistance offerings that we have. Um, some of them I will um, defer to, to Paul Johnson and provide his contact information if you're interested in any of those, including the short-term rental management software um, and the cost-to-serve modeling. Um, I don't know if you want to add any details. Well, I'll just about say Old Orchard those. Beach was our first one. Yeah, yeah. it's working have, great. Yeah, it's working great yeah, for you. Yeah. yeah. You have one of the most short-term rentals in the yes in the 1500. state. Fifteen hundred. So this this yeah. um, this is a as a software program that our brilliant Paul Johnson basically invented, and there are other market-based services out there, but you can get it for a lot less money through us, um, and it's much more municipal back and oriented, so you can do your enforcement through it. The idea is if we we have four communities that are now signed up. If we get more, we think that we could regionalize enforcement, which would help you not have to pay for as much code enforcement officer time. So it's a pretty cool thing, and we hope you take advantage of it. And the cost of surf modeling, this actually came out of John Klucher, mm -hmm. who is on Scarborough, who does this kind of modeling, and um, allows you to take a look at what kinds of different housing configurations would yield in terms of your net tax benefit or revenue. Some things cost more, some things will give you more. So it's a fiscal modeling that's tailored to your community that Paul works with John Klucher actually to do. We've done it for a few different communities now. And it allows your council to have more information in understanding the impact of a specific development on your tax base. Another brilliant Paul Johnson, John Klucher partnership. Great. Um, and then the, the next three services um, 
are among many that we can do uh, for your local housing um, needs. Uh, including a housing needs assessment. We're, we're currently doing one um, for Wyndham under the Housing Opportunity Program um, to assess the projected growth um, and housing needs. Um, we can do site analyses. We're doing a number of those right now. Um, so if you have a particular site in mind that you'd like us to take a look at, uh, we could do that. Um, we can also turn that into a community engagement process if you'd like to understand what your community is interested in for a particular site. Um, and then one of our newer services is um, looking at uh, permitting processes and providing recommendations to improve efficiency. Uh, we just did this recently in South Portland and it was a really big success there. Um, we were able to identify a few sticking points for them. Uh, what, what essentially we do is we look at um, permitting processes in one community <laughs> Um, as compared to the average community. So we can really get a sense of which, which ones to prioritize in terms of making them more efficient. Um, so those are, those are some of the um, technical assistance that we're able to offer for um, housing and land use. All right, and then I'll introduce Tom Bell, who's with us, who is our communications director, to talk a little bit about what we do over in comms. The, um, Hello, everybody. I'm Tom Bell. Um, as you know, the newspaper industry has been in decline. And as you've seen, there's no longer a common shared understanding of, of the facts. And this creates a news vacuum. And in this vacuum, uh, bad actors can cause you headaches. And so what municipalities are doing is filling that vacuum with their own communications uh, efforts. Um, and what I'm doing is, is, is in some cases, helping smaller communities that don't have their own communication staff or helping uh, communication staff uh, do a better job. Uh, today I met with a communication person in, in gray and I did an audit of their uh, different platforms and we talked about how in gray they're still sending out their newsletter and, and a PDF. Um, and um, it's not the best practice because they're they get caught in spam filters. They, they, um, they don't work well on different platforms like cell phones. And so we're going to help Town of Gray design a new uh, uh, digital newsletter. Uh, one of the models I gave Gray was the newsletter from Scarborough. Which is awesome. Yeah, um, which is um, a high performer. You have a 70% uh, open rate. Uh, I talked with Allison. Uh, My colleagues, that. if you host the next meeting, you'll get all the praise too. <laughs> <laughs> 4,500 subscribers. Um, also, uh, talk with the, uh, the, the window. They have a new communications person there, and, and we're going to do the same thing there. In Freeport, we helped the town. We, uh, they had a uh, bond issue on the ballot to, to fund new sidewalks. And, actually uh, bike trails over new bridges DOT was building. We created a, a website to educate the public about this effort. And in conjunction, conjunction with that, we created a social media campaign that led people, drove people to the website to learn about, about this bond uh, issue. And it, it passed in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, I was, um, I helped with, uh, the sticky wicket of LD 2003, Cape Elizabeth, and we held uh, information uh, um, uh, forum for residents. I wrote op-eds on behalf of the town councilor. Um, and uh, actually, one, one meeting in Cape Elizabeth, a uh, resident complained, how come you uh, hired you because that op-ed was so great? He's under somebody else's name. Yeah. <laughs> So, so um, and, and also we help with uh, the CAPE on evaluation, revaluation, and uh, also an op-ed um, from the tax uh, assessor. And we brought the town manager and, and the assessor into uh, WMPG where we have a radio show. Uh, and I recorded it on video and we gave the town the recording of the video, which they put on their website had a link on YouTube that the assessor could send to people uh, who had specific questions. And the, and the goal there was to show that, that 
that, you know, that humanize the tax assessor, show that he was highly qualified, and explain the process and, and try to get out ahead of the, you know, the noise that happens with the revaluation. Um, also, I'm a, I was a reporter for 16 years at the Post Herald, so I understand the media environment, I have relationships with the press, and so I'm available if you have a difficult press issue, just call me and I could uh, think about, strategize about uh, how to get some positive press for you. Do you want to mention the crisis communications training? As well? Yeah, November 20th, uh, we're having a crisis communications training uh, for the PACs and Chicago members, for your town managers, uh, fire chiefs, police chiefs, your communication staff, and it's going to be um, uh, uh, 11 o'clock on, uh, on Wednesday, the, the 20th. We're going to have David Farmer, who does this uh, for a living, uh, hired in, uh, hired, towns hire him when they're having a communications crisis. Uh, we're going to have the communications person from the town of Montpelier. She was uh, the town's first communications staffer, and she uh, gets her new job, and she says, you guys don't have a communications, a crisis communications plan. So she put together the town's crisis communications plan, and shortly thereafter, they had a flood that had the town under four feet of water. So lesson there is do not write a crisis communications plan. <laughs> <laughs> Never know what will happen yeah. when you're prepared. <laughs> um, so she's going to come, and she's going to actually have a, a, a crisis communications plan template that towns can, can use as a starting point to start creating their own plans. We're also gonna have the communications uh, director from the city of Lewiston. A year ago, uh, last week, Lewiston had that terrible shooting and, 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 and the city was inundated with press from around the country. She's gonna talk about that experience. Um, so, and it's, it's designed as a round table as, as much as a training because I think the people in the room will have their own, as much of their own uh, lessons for the group to, to teach uh, others at, at the meeting. Um, so um, that's it. Uh, that's, thank you uh, for, for, for uh, we have a question. I have yes. a question. Yeah. So, so we are likely going to have an expensive school solution on the bond maybe next year. Mm -hmm. So is this something that GP Cog could help consult with us to figure out how we develop a good communications plan from the moment we decide what the solution is to through bond approval, because I think that was a tough challenge we had last time was we really lost the narrative mm -hmm. when the school went to bond and it is gonna be very expensive and that's hard for people to overcome. And I think while we'll have residents very engaged on it, they may not have the expertise to actually think through all the things that we need right. to do to. Yeah, I think the town would, be, would benefit from a, a you know, a, a strategic communications campaign mm -hmm. uh, and, and a website and a social media campaign. And that'd be something I would love to, to, to help with. Mm -hmm. And in the instance of when we helped Freeport um, in advance of their bond vote, our role was to describe the project and the benefits and have some highlights of that. We didn't do the political campaign piece, right? Mm -hmm. Just like a town can't really run the yeah. political campaign. But the folks that were running the campaign had a place where they can point to like neutrally developed information that describes what the investment would look like. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah, and I think I think that's important to be able to like get the facts out there and yeah. make sure that the facts are there. Because again, I think that's at least in Scarborough, and I'm sure it's somewhere in other communities. We have pretty strong packs that are really good at getting those sound bites out. That yeah always put us on the defense. And so what we need to be able to do is proactively get the facts out there as much as we can to make sure that the public gets that information and hopefully from a trusted source. Let us know. Mm -hmm. So I know we only have like two minutes left. Took the words out of my mouth. What do we have left? To so we have uh, a little bit about sustainability and then we are done. Well, I think maybe on sustainability, we've got John who's here and he used to drive back to New Hampshire. So I want to make sure John um, has a moment to explain some of the work that he's doing. Yeah. And, and I think um, Scarborough is well aware of all of our sustainability offerings and we work with SMPDC all the time. So maybe you want to just go right yeah, into the I'll touch heat. The tops. Yeah, so um, our sustainability team is really all centered around building resilience communities 
And the way that we do this is we can guide communities through various planning processes, supporting project implementation, leading community engagement, doing data collection and analysis, and providing funding resources. So we've been very busy doing municipal climate action plans. We've done, I think, six now at this point, um, which includes a greenhouse gas emissions inventory, a vulnerability assessment, a lot of community engagement, and then the ultimate plan is a both community and municipally driven um, action plan. So um, really great resource for communities um, to do resiliency planning in their communities. Um, we also have been doing a lot of environmental planning looking at conservation of land in communities, looking at open space planning and stormwater management. Um, and then funding is always a huge conversation that's top of mind. So we can assist members in our communities with funding for technical resources, um, financial resources, serve as a fis fiscal host, um, and provide resources and data for grant applications. And being a regional organization, we're obviously very focused on regional initiatives. Um, so we have a lot of data that we share out with the groups, intertidal data portal. Um, we also have a clean transportation dashboard. Um, and then as you're all sort of familiar with Connect 2045, GPCOG's long range transportation plan um, for the PACS region um, has a sort of list of goals and priorities that have been outlined in that plan. One of those is a 70% um, reduction in transportation emissions by 2045. And so our team is directly working um, on strategies and identifying those key actions that will help our region achieve those transportation emissions goals. Um, and so what we're focusing on right now is developing a regional strategy and sort of a pathway for all the communities in our region to achieve that transportation emissions goal. Um, and we're working on a EV charging infrastructure plan. So we've already kicked off this process and we've been deep in the weeds um, doing community engagement. It's a picture from uh, of our staff um, actually just earlier this month um, tabling at the Sustainable Scarborough Day. So we actually helped coordinate the EV ride and drive that was um, an add-on to the great list of vendors that were, were offered um, in, in Scarborough. And um, now we're at the process where we're looking for additional input. So we're specifically looking for municipal input, um, elected and appointed um, community members. Can go to the next slide. Um, so we are working on sort of coordinating a municipal working group. Um, it's sort of vague and, and who um, will attend and who can attend. So we're looking and gonna be deferring to municipal staff to sort of send people that are already engaged in this work have this listed as a priority and want to um, both provide input and also um, get educated on what's happening in the region. And so what we're looking to do is, is share and um, share out all the, the data that we've been collecting on the past year on EV adoption trends, doing some EV infrastructure forecasting work, looking at what EV adoption or um, how many EV drivers there might be at 2030, 2045, and those 2050 milestones. Um, so really hoping to foster some strong regional collaboration, make sure that everyone's sort of um, working with the same information and the latest data that we have available to us. Uh, preparing your community to have a smooth transition to this massive influx of electrification for the transportation sector. So I will caveat that this is primarily looking at light duty electrification, but there will be some conversations as well around sort of integrating um, broader transportation initiatives. Um, this is also going to be key to have input to inform the regional priorities and decisions that we will be including in this strategy um, and hoping to share some insights that we've been gathering from community members um, from all these communities that we've been attending to um, and talking with um, throughout the past few months and will continue to do for the next few months. Uh, the first meeting will be December 11th and we will send out a formal invite um, to all of your communities. Specifically to municipal staff, you can sort of um, disperse the invite to um, who you see best fit. Thank you, Ron. I'm going to skip that. We're over time, but I just want to say thank you to everyone. So we just gave you a lot of information. I recognize that. If you have any questions or if anything that popped up tonight is of interest to you, my contact is in... Uh, the member services guide, and also the facilitation form. And then lastly, I'm going to grab the route one 
cards from everyone because those are really important little pieces of information. But any last questions that come to mind while we're still here? Put up your card. <laughs> I, I have a quick, quick question just building off of what John said. Um, one of the things that our members have asked us, some of our members started to ask us through the strategic planning process that we just did was uh, how the grid is going to be well prepared for all this electrification. I can see some nodding heads. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering which of the communities are thinking about that right now, like working on <clears throat> grid stuff? You are. Oh, okay. No, I would say the downs is a whole. And okay. that's been an issue from them from day one, okay. is the grid in general. And so there's been pushback around the EV charging ordinance that we have in place and other uh, yes. pieces. Okay. So as we kind of look for the future, it's like, we need to solve that yeah. for the town in order to help our developers kind of move through that. Okay. One of the interesting statistics that I heard. Oh, to have right. the developers part of that? Is that what you're saying? No, I just want, I just, I'm interested to know the new information It's constantly changing. Yeah. Because yeah. our ordinance yeah. was written a few years ago and we're already like, yeah, we knew we were going to have to tweak it, but I yeah. think it would be really great to be part of a bigger group to understand. That would be great, yeah. And John does a great job keeping everybody up to date on all the newest technologies and with a lot of vendors and a lot, and the utilities are actually Can part of that group. Can I invite you to a meeting? What's that? Can I invite you to a meeting in a few yeah. weeks? Yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah. for sure. John's, yeah, John we has got a lot of expertise in this. And I already have an email started to you about, <laughs> I need a little soundbite. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. 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 You think going last <laughs> is going to save you. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's awesome, yeah. I remember we were involved in some of the initial conversations with the developers in the development of the EV ordinance. So, um, yeah, happy to share some updated information. And, and, it, and I know Paul connect with Paul because I know Paul is also kind of thinking about the EV charger issues as, as well as other things going on at the Downs. So. Re Rebecca Ryan is one of the um, well-known national futurists for local governments. Um, I saw her speak at the when you got right. her to come to the yeah, MMA well, commission. She just presented her next 10 big things at ICMA. Um, and if you go back and she was working for the Alliance for Innovation. So if you go back 10 years and look at what her work was and how accurate she was, one of the forecasts that is out there right now is that in the next eight, we've been averaging about 5% per year growth in electricity demand nationally. Over the next, um, I think it's like eight or 10 years, that is actually projected to be at 81%. And that rolling brownouts will become a reality in this country over the next three to five years. And nobody's talking about it. And if you take a look at what the averages in order from the time somebody decides they need to put a transmission line in until it actually gets built, it's like 12 years. And so as you're looking at the sustainability piece and all those other things, I don't know where the state is going to be, but let's let's assume that the state has our act together and we're in great shape. People that are having other role around rolling brownouts in other areas are going to be part of the reality. You're going to start doing the same thing they did during COVID, another impact in where the thing is. The other thing that was fascinating is something like 83% of the known earth materials that are needed to deal with electricity issues are controlled or owned by China. Mm. Happy note to end on. <laughs> just stop the attitude that's out there. Good stuff. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you understand the, the, the blackout stuff. Yeah, I know. No, I, I, it is one of the biggest issues we've got to be dealing with. I still didn't